prayer is, and we prayed before we came out and going was that each one of you will hear you know, what the Lord wants to speak into your heart and mind. So we're all on a journey, you know, hopefully coming closer and closer to Jesus, whether we're still seeking and still wondering where it's all about, whether we walk with the Lord for you know, 50, 60 years or whatever, we can all become more like Jesus. We can all draw closer to him. So each one of us are at different stages. We have different backgrounds. We have different understandings. But we serve the same Lord. We have the same word of God. And so each one of us will hear something different this morning. So as I share, I really pray that the Lord will just... Certain things, there's going to be a lot out there. Um, certain things will find a place in your heart, in your mind, and will encourage you in your own personal walk, but also, importantly, encourage you to step out and to share the gospel, you know, to share, to connect with people. Um, there's much um, turmoil in the world, as I shared last night. Lots of things happening, lots of things that we're facing as a nation, as a world. Um, but we really believe that... You know, God's word provides that answer, doesn't it? Amen. And the God revealed in his word, uh, this is the instruction book of life, and we can, um, can't go wrong if we base our lives on his word rather than man's fallible opinions. So I just want to start off by, um, there's two very well-known scriptures. Uh, so if you've got your Bibles here, John chapter 1, verses 1 to 5. And this is, again, talking about Jesus. I want to really set the, uh, the scripture here that really just talks about Jesus as the agent of creation. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords, but he's also the agent of creation. So John chapter 1, uh, verses 1 to 5. It says, uh, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. It's pretty clear cut, isn't it? Mm -hmm. okay. So he's, some people, you know, some uh, sects and so on say that Jesus is created, you know, the first one of creation, he was, you know, he's just, a, he's not actually the creator. Uh, but it says there clearly that everything was made, invisible, invisible, and so on. It's just uh, very, very clear in scripture. And the second one is very similar to it. There's a lot of parallels with this. This is Colossians chapter one, verses 13 to 18. And this again is talking about Jesus. Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 to 18. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins? And I'm going to be sharing this about the whole gospel, you know, the good news, and how it ties in with this. But here we have... We, the beautiful hymns this morning, wasn't it? It's talking about we, we're, we're redeemed, I'm redeemed. And we have a hope and a future because we've been made right before God. This is beautiful. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him all things were created that are in heaven and are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. So it's all about Jesus, isn't it? As I said last night, we have creation, evolution, we have science, we have all that stuff, but ultimately it boils down to Jesus. You know, he's the center of the Bible, but the whole history leading up, everything points, the Old Testament points to the Savior. And then, of course, Jesus, his ministry, and then, of course, we have the hope of a redemption in the future with the new heavens and the new earth. So it's very, very Jesus-centric is the Bible. He is God. Okay, so this is one of our favorite scriptures, and as Creation Ministries, we really affirm this. And uh, this is a command, not just a, a helpful suggestion for us as believers. 1 Peter 3.15, it says, Sanctify the Lord God in your heart. So we need to have a relationship with God and be able to honor him. For who he is. He is God, isn't it? So sanctify God. That's the number one thing. And always be ready to give an answer. When somebody asks you why, why you believe what you do, or why are you different, why don't you do this, whatever, we need to have an answer. And that comes back, as I said last night, to our personal testimony. Each one of us has that, or hopefully has that, or is working on your testimony, that as God is um, changing you, Jesus has come in and made a difference in your life. And we can celebrate that, can't we? Nobody can take away your personal testimony, so really, really hang on to that. It's beautiful. 
Um, give an answer to every man that asks you of the reason for the hope that's in you, and do it with meekness and fear and with gentleness and respect, you know, not um, being afraid to just speak out. This is, this is what it's about. The world wants to shut us down, doesn't it? Says we're irrelevant, we're a side issue, you know, you, you're outdated, you believe a whole bunch of myths. But no, we can stand up with respect, but also hold our ground and say, no, I believe God's word and this is why. So what we're doing as a ministry is to try to equip you to have, give you answers that can help you to strengthen your faith and to make you more confident to reach out and connect with people who are struggling. On that theme, you know, we have to ask, again, is the church in the West, especially, um, are we still reaching the lost as, as a whole? You know, we see that the church has lost its microphone in society, hasn't it? We used to be very influential. You know, our Western civilization was built on a, on a Judeo-Christian background. You know, people understood the Ten Commandments. They basically had a basic Bible knowledge with prayer in schools and parliament. Uh, even our national anthem, a beautiful prayer, isn't it? I know there's people want to get rid of that. But at the moment, even if people are unbelievers, they sing the national anthem, they're actually declaring a prayer. They're declaring something spiritual, aren't they, over our nation. And um, long may it last. But we see, again, from the statistics here, we just see church attendance declining across the West. We see um, depression, anxiety, suicide increasing, especially among our beautiful young people. And we see lawlessness and disorder and violence increasing, crime and uh, corruption and so on happening. So we're seeing that, that you know, the world is becoming a darker place, but there's also many good things that are happening. We can celebrate the good you know, God is moving, isn't he? And people have, a, I think, a more open heart. And the world's not providing answers. The world's not providing stability. So people are seeking. So people are more open than you think. You know, We think that people are always anti-God, and but many people want to hear truth. And when they hear truth, it, it makes sense. So let's have a quick look at this whole thing about evangelism in the West. Okay, so then and now, now I can um, fess up, I was actually born in 1961, so, so some of you are really, really old. Others here are not so old, you know, maybe a bit of a young chap. Anyway, so in my generation, uh, when I was brought up in school in Nelson, at, at Waimea College, we had hymns in school, and, and we also had um, rallies, there was different evangelistic things happening. So here's a, an amazing picture before my time, but here's um, Billy Graham, one of the most amazing modern evangelists of all time, wasn't it? Here he is um, speaking in London in 1954. You look at those thousands of people all just listening in, soaking in what he's hearing, they're crowding around, hungry, and thousands and thousands of people came to the Lord throughout his ministry in America and Europe and even in New Zealand. Um, some of you here may have yourself or known other people who came to the Lord through Billy Graham. So that was amazing. And here he is, he's saying, repent. You know, Jesus died for your sin. A very simple message. He preached from the word of God and he said, repent. You know, commit your life to God. Turn from your sins. It's amazing, isn't it? But do we see that now? Do we see Billy Graham type rallies in the West? No. So what's changed? The key thing is, our culture has changed. We've shifted, haven't we? As, as a culture, our Western culture has declined and shifted away from that biblical basis that we had. Now, not everyone was a Christian, even back when I was a kid. People, you know, they had a basic idea. They were good people. But we were cultural Christians. Many people didn't have a, a relationship with Jesus personally, but they still believed the Bible. They tried to live by the Ten Commandments. And, but now that's, that's shifted a lot. So if we go out now, I'm talking about the church here. If we went out and we said, you know, went down the main street here in Christchurch, and we said, you know, repent, Jesus died for your sins. Turn. You know, what sort of a re um, reaction are you going to get from the average person in the street? if they don't cross the road to get away from you. It's going to be maybe even something like this, isn't it? What? What are you going on about? You know, I'm a good person. I don't need to be saved. You know? And well, that's offensive. You can't tell me what to do. You know, this, the whole thing. Well, what a bunch of idiots. You know, a lot of people will react like that, especially if you do it in the old style idea, you know, with um, the sandwich board and preaching the gospel in the old style. So something's shifted, hasn't it? The gospel's not falling upon ears, especially in a public arena like it used to. So there's actually two accounts in Scripture that are really um, powerful indication of how the gospel never changes, but how we present it needs to change to adapt to where the hearers are coming from. So we've got um, two examples, in, both in the book of Acts. So on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came and mightily filled um, the disciples and other people there with power and boldness, and they went out from, instead of cowering and hiding, and they went out and they started to preach, and they had all the godly Jews collected together. And they got out. And here's Peter. He's actually speaking to these Jewish people who were there uh, for the feast. And he said, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made the same Jesus whom you crucified, 
both Lord and Christ. Now, well, this is pretty radical. He's actually saying, Jesus, Yeshua, is the Messiah. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked to their heart, and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? That's almost like Billy Graham, wasn't it? People, you saw them, when he actually preached the gospel, people, you know, I need to repent, and they would step forward and gave their heart because their hearts were pricked. It was a response to that message. So all Peter had to do was preach Jesus, preach Yeshua as the Messiah. And they, they were ready. They responded in their thousands. And so here we have a, a diagram. So we've got the three steps of the gospel. Basically, we have God created the world perfect. And sin and death came in through Adam and Eve's sin, their disobedience. And then in due season, Jesus the Messiah came. And uh, he laid down the ultimate sacrifice, gave his life, and then he was raised from the dead to, provoke, to pay the price for our sin, for all of us. To be, to, uh, to be reconnected with God, our Saviour, our, our Lord. And of course, eventually we look forward to the consummation of all things, where God will recreate the heavens and the earth, and all the things, the mad planet we live on now, will be renewed the way it was intended to be in the first place. And so here's uh, Peter again saying, Let the house of Israel know for certain that God's made him both Lord and Christ, the Jesus whom you crucified. And of course the Jews, they actually already believed, they knew about God, they had the whole sacrificial system, they knew they were sinners, they needed to repent, and they needed to go and take offerings and sacrifices year after year, follow the feasts. And so um, redemption by the shedding of blood was something that was temporary and had to be repeated. But they knew they needed to come before God. So when they suddenly had this uh, Messiah presented, it made sense to them, and so they responded, what should we do? See, because they already had a biblical foundation in place. They were ready to hear the gospel and respond. Then we move across to Paul, who's an amazing apostle, and he was in Greece. And, um, of course, Peter added just, just the, uh, the gospel. Yeah, but the, Greek, the Greeks were very different. They had no foundations. So here's Paul, he went across and he started to preach about the resurrection and so on. They, they started to say, well, what foolishness is this? this? This man's babbling. He says, waffling, what's he going on about? You know, resurrection of the dead, I don't know. So he went out into their culture and he started to walk around and look at their, their temples and their icons and their, you know, their businesses and so on. He noticed that they're very superstitious, they're very religious here. There's all sorts of God um, idols and temples and so on. And he suddenly came across this um, one that had a, a, an altar and it had a, on it the unknown God. And Paul's coming back to them and he said, I've been out and I've looked around. As I pass by and I beheld your devotions, in other words, he said, I see you are very religious. And I found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. So you see the Greeks were very, um, they wanted to make sure that the gods were happy. So just in case we missed one, we better make one to the unknown God. So they set this altar up just to cover their bases. And um, Paul went back and he said, therefore ye uh, ignorantly worship him I declare to you, the God that made the world and all things therein, seeing he is the Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. So he said, this God that you call unknown, let me tell you about him. He's the creator. You know, you worship the sun, moon, and all these things. We know there's a God who created all this. These things are not gods. So he went back to basics. So when he presented the gospel, the gospel was the same. The same idea of creation, a fall. We need a redemption. A saviour's come in. And then we have a consummation of all things. But he had a very different audience. And see, they had no biblical basis at all. So he actually went back. And he added in that creation foundation that God is the creator. And then he talks about um, sin and, and so on. So eventually, Jesus makes sense in the context of knowing that God is a creator. He's a good God, a perfect God, a just God. And we need to be saved from our sin. So he had to actually add that um, creation evangelism level in. So coming back to us again, here we are the church. We need to actually be aware that the people out there now, even in New Zealand, most of them have a Greek way of thinking. They're not connected with that idea of being Jewish, you know, having a biblical basis. So when we talk about Jesus and you know, uh, David and the Psalms or Adam and Eve or Noah, most people don't, well, what are you talking about? Oh, I haven't heard of that. Oh, oh hell, that's, that's a really good pizza brand, isn't it? You know, there's all these things now that we took for granted as being doctrine. Now people just don't understand. You know, Jesus will say that that's just a swear word. And, you know, all these sort of things. So people don't have a, even a basic biblical knowledge. There's no teaching of it in the schools. There's nothing on um, secular TV. And so we need to think we actually, when we pre preach the gospel, we don't change the gospel, but we need to be wise in how we present it. And we don't get this response. 
but if we build the creation evangelism thing in, that's what our resources are for, to, to break down barriers to that ignorance of the Bible, these misconceptions, so you can then preach the gospel and point people to Jesus with a foundation, otherwise there's nothing to build on. So I talked last night about, it's really down to this whole thing about uh, which authority are we going to trust? God's word, or are we going to trust man's fallible opinions? And I, again, I had this picture last night of the things that we're addressing in society, these uh, pressures and these pushes, these agendas that are, are being pushed into uh, politics and into society, actually have their roots much, much deeper. It's about the authority of God's word or you know, man's evolving ideas and his opinions. And so we, we need to deal with the fruit, but be aware, we pray and we battle against the spiritual strongholds that are underneath that as well. When it comes down to this thing about the Bible, do we trust the Bible or do we trust man's opinion? It's always the Bible that's under attack, isn't it? Well, maybe Genesis is just metaphor or myth, or maybe this is, wasn't really real, and etc., etc. et cetera, snip, snip, snip. You know? Man's opinions always are held up as being the authority. And I'm going to give you some sad examples of where that slippery slope of theology uh, declining has, has got to. That's why, um, as Creation Ministries International, we actually have a simple theme this year, the Psalm 1, uh, 119, 160. Just take God at his word and trust God as you know, he's our king, our saviour. He's given us a written word to reveal himself, to give us the history of the world. Why not just trust it? And as we see, there's so much evidence why we can trust the Bible from uh, archaeology, paleontology, biology, geology. We don't need to be afraid of defending the Bible. Now, speaking about defending the Bible, that's where um, you're very familiar with Creation Ministries International. Uh, I spoke last night, and my colleague Mike down the back there, by the way, I forgot to introduce you, Mike. Of course, you know him, he's, he's part of the family here, isn't he? Mike CEO, as well as I'm Mike CEO. Yeah, so Mike's based here in Christchurch, as some happened earlier, he's our speaker in the South Island. A great guy, he's got the resources uh, out the back there, and also uh, at home as well. So we both represent Creation Ministries International, and that's a non-denominational donation-funded ministry that has got offices in seven uh, countries around the world. And we've got an uh, office here in uh, only Hamer in Auckland. And our mission is very, very simple. It's actually to equip the body of Christ, which is you, which is me, so we can go out there with credible answers that affirm the reliability of the Bible, especially beginning with Genesis, because that's foundational. So how do we do that? Again, our website is probably one of our key resources. We really encourage you to... Make use, make use of our website. Really, really hard to remember. Well, just creation.com. How simple can you get? And that's a real answer to prayer. It's a miracle how we got that URL. You know? Creation.com, you think it would be snapped up? It did cost some money, but God was um, really opened the door for us to get that. So it's a powerful address to remember. Creation.com. Again, we've got thousands of articles, um, DV, uh, sorry, YouTube videos, PDF files, all sorts of things you can download, share and um, make use of absolutely free. We've also got um, quite a number of pages of translation into different languages. Here's an example of, um, I spoke in an Afrikaans church a couple of weeks ago, and here's a page outlining one of our, our speakers who went to South Africa and did a tour, and we have that exact same article in Afrikaans. We've also got um, you know, different other languages too, especially uh, um, some of the Asian languages, quite a bit of work gone into that as well. So if you've got people who English is not their first language, go to our website, have a look at other languages, and you'll find a whole raft of articles that have been translated. And we also have a weekly newsletter that comes out, email newsletter called InfoBytes. Now, I talked about this little novelty ball here. Again, a year ago, none of us would have known what that was. Now it's burned into our psyche, isn't it? The whole coronavirus, how do we deal with that? Where's God in all this? How can a good God allow bad things to happen? So um, whenever something big happens in society, like coronavirus, the mosque massacres last year, whatever, our speakers and writers will actually come up with an article fairly quickly that addresses those findings or that, that event. And so um, many of you may already sign up. Mike's going to pass the clipboards around shortly. So if you'd like to connect with our ministry and you're not already signed up, uh, it's completely no strings attached. We'd just love to inform you with what's going on in the world, give you biblical answers, but also tell you about events that are on in your area. So when they come around, just fill out your name and your email address and your phone number. The phone number is the backup if your email address is a bit illegible, as mine would tend to be. Okay, so we'd love to connect with you so you can be aware of what we're doing as a ministry. Okay, so this is coming back to Jesus. It's all about Jesus is the key. 
Now, this is a very straightforward scripture when Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and they were going on and on and doubting who he was and so on. And he said, um, Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There's one that accuseth you, even Moses. Now, of course, Moses was the author of the Pentateuch, the Torah, the first five books of, of our Bible. And that was the law, the law and so on. So they really, really respected the Torah. That was the, the core. And so Jesus is saying, you don't believe me, but Moses, he actually accuses you. Uh, you trust Moses. If you believe Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if ye believe not his writings, uh, how then shall you believe my words? In other words, if you don't believe the history that's contained within Genesis especially, then why should you trust uh, Jesus when he talks about spiritual things? So if you don't believe the flood, you don't believe in Adam and Eve, you don't believe about the creation, why should you believe Jesus when he said, I've gone to prepare a place, I'm going to prepare a place for you, or I'm going to rise from the dead? That's not scientific, is it? See, so if we won't trust things that we can test historically, why would we trust the spiritual aspects of the Bible? So it's a big thing, isn't it? And Jesus himself, especially, you now I'm going to talk about Jesus in, in uh, detail, but the book of Genesis is really, really important. It's a foundational book of the Bible. Almost all our key doctrines that we um, believe as Christians are rooted and founded in Genesis, especially Genesis chapters 1 to 11. Well, why Genesis chapters 1 to 11? Because that covers you know, creation, the fall, the flood, Babel, right through up to Abraham. So those first 11 books of Genesis are the most controversial, the most uh, attacked books in the Bible, uh, verses in the Bible. And yet we look at that, there's over 200 quotations and references back to Genesis, a hundred of them specifically to Genesis chapters 1 to 11. All 11 uh, Genesis chapters are referenced, so every, every um, chapter in Genesis 1 to 11 are, have references in the New Testament. And every New Testament author not just um, you know, um, Matthew or Luke or Paul, all of them referred back to Genesis. They taught their doctrine from it. They believed it as history. They referenced people uh, and events in Genesis as being real history. And the key thing is Jesus himself refers to Genesis chapters 1 to 11 on six specific occasions. And when he's outlining you know, about marriage, do you not know from the beginning of creation he created a male and female? And for this reason, a man shall leave his mother and his father and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. So he was talking about God as the creator, and they were created from the beginning, you know, in the six-day creation week, not after billions of years of evolution. And we have this binary idea, male and female, and a marriage between a man and a woman for life, and the idea of coming together to be one flesh. So Jesus taught that from Genesis as doctrine. Oh, but we hear these days lots of smart um, you know, the uh, theologians and so on. And here's an example of this fine-looking man here, uh, Kenton Sparks. He works for a theistic evolutionary think tank uh, called BioLogos. And they are very, they're very much out to try to teach evolution can be wedged into the Bible. And he actually talks about Jesus. You know, Jesus is a finite human being. He erred from time to time. I mean, he made mistakes. You know, he was a man of his time. He, he did well. He had some good teachings, but he didn't have the science we have today. And therefore, because Jesus got it wrong, we also have no reason to suppose that Moses, Paul, John, they also wrote scripture without error. So, yeah, even those guys got it wrong. Some of these things they wrote were just framed within the, their worldview. We're wise to assume that the biblical authors expressed themselves as human beings writing from, their, the, from the perspectives of their own finite, broken horizons. In other words, they were pretty ignorant compared to what we have today. This is a big deal, isn't it? I'm saying Jesus was a fallible person who didn't have the science we have today. Jesus is, you know, a man's opinion is actually lording it over scripture. And actually, this is actually heresy, isn't it? That Jesus is not God. He didn't really know what he's talking about. Even though Jesus said, everything I, I speak to you, the Father's given me to speak. So you're actually saying that God got it wrong. God didn't know about the history. So this is a big deal. If you're saying that Jesus was a fallible human, then uh, you've got big troubles theologically. Now some people say, well, science seems to have proven evolution is, is true. I, I love God, I believe God created, but evolution is pretty hard to argue against that. I know, God used evolution. You know, God created, but he used evolution. Hey, you've heard that before? This is called theistic evolution. So I want to just show you briefly why theologically, talking about the gospel, talking about Jesus, why this falls apart really badly. Scripture is very, very clear about where bad things came into creation. It says, 
Therefore, just by one man, sorry, therefore, as by one man, Adam, sin entered the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men because all have sinned. So it's clear that death and sin were not part of the original creation. It was Adam and Eve's disobedience, and God said, Look, I love you, but I give you free will. If you want to run the whole show, I'm going to step back, I'm going to take some of my sustaining power away, and things will start to fall apart. You're dying, you will die. There's going to be pain, there's going to be thorns and thistles, and things are going to come in. The whole of creation is going to grow because of what, you know, if you want to run it, um, yeah, have your own way. And so, two histories of death is really, really important to understand this idea. You know, could God have used evolution? Death, if you believe evolution, death has always been here. Right since the first uh, replicating creature started off in a warm soup somewhere, over billions of years, things have died over and over again. The more successful have reproduced, those less successful have been weeded out. But each generation dies, death, death, death. So death is just tough. It's the way it is. Get over it. God may give you some comfort in, the, in your pain, but death is just the way nature is. But scripture is very clear that death is actually an intruder. It's the last enemy. It came in. It's not the way God created it, uh, the world. And so it's actually not the way it is. It's a bad thing. And it's not um, part of God's intention for us. Now this picture here is, is a really powerful way of, of explaining it. It's one that really impacted me when I first saw it. So here we have um, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, as it's described in Genesis chapter 2, 1 and 2. And it's beautiful. They walk with God in the cool of the evening, and we have all the animals. Everything's vegetarian. There's no pain and suffering, no bloodshed. And everything is very good. And as God said, he declared everything very good after day six. But if evolution was true, and I say if evolution was true, and Adam had gone out and started digging away in the backyard, what do you think he may have found if evolution was true? That's right. Yeah. Fossils. I've actually got, I've got a fossil here, and I always make the joke, it never wears thin, um, that some people think I'm the fossil, but no, this is a real fossil. Okay? So I'm going to pass a couple around in a moment. But yes, that's right, so all around the world we've got trillions of dead things buried all around in sedimentary rock, and uh, the fossil record is a very, very powerful evidence of some past event. One of the things we notice about fossils is every fossil is dead, isn't it? Would you agree that when you find a fossil that's actually dead? So something was alive, and it died, and it turned into a fossil. So every fossil is a record of death. But you also look at the fossil record, and you find there's lots of horrible ways to die. You find all sorts of things, you know, carnivory, there's been accidents, there's been things being squashed and uh, burned and crushed and drowned and so on. So the whole fossil record is a record of unbelievable pain, suffering, bloodshed, and, 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 and uh, bad things. And we also find diseases right through the fossil record, even dinosaur fossils uh, showing evidence of cancers and osteoarthritis and all sorts of things. So the fossil record is a record of horrible stuff. Now either we can believe that's a result of God's um, judgment upon a sinful world, as scripture clearly says in four whole chapters of Genesis, or it's the result of millions of years of evolutionary struggle that God used to create us. So a God who used this sort of process to create me, I'm, I'm out of here if that's the case. I'm not going to worship a God who used such an inefficient, painful, bloodthirsty, wasteful way to create us. So evolution, trying to say God used evolution, destroys the goodness of God, doesn't it? The uniqueness of man destroys the credibility of Jesus, and it destroys the gospel itself. And um, atheists are often really, really astute. They can show things up for what they are. And this is a powerful quote from uh, an American atheist, Frank Zindler, quoted a number of years ago. And um, it's, it's, it's a longish little quote, but have a listen to this here. So he's actually speaking, and I agree with him. If you believe evolution, what he says is actually true. No, I don't, uh, and we have the answer against this. But he said, the most devastating thing that biology did to Christianity was the discovery of biological evolution. Okay? Now we know then that Adam and Eve never were real people, that is a myth. Therefore, the central myth of Christianity has been destroyed. So you can see Adam and Eve, physical Adam and Eve, is really important to the whole thing of Christianity. If there never was an Adam and Eve, there never was an original sin. Okay, yeah. If Adam and Eve didn't exist, yes, they couldn't have fallen, so the fall was a myth. If there never was an original sin, there's no need of salvation. 
Yes, I can see that. If there's no need of salvation, then there's no need of a saviour. See where it's going? Down the track. And I submit that that puts Jesus, historical or otherwise, well maybe Jesus didn't even exist. And some people are saying now that Jesus was just a myth, you know, it's just a, amazing, isn't it? You think of the change in history we've had because of Jesus. He said that actually puts Jesus into the ranks of the unemployed. We don't need a saviour. I think evolution is absolutely the death knell of Christianity. Yeah, so it's big stuff, isn't it? And a lot of the people like around Darwin's era, they actually wanted to have, bring evolution into free science from Moses. They want to get rid of this idea of a, the old myth of the Ten Commandments and the Bible to get us free of these shackles. So this is a big deal, isn't it? Evolution is completely incompatible uh, with the Gospel. So coming back to the good news of Jesus, we need to actually share with people the bad news that we are all sinners. We're, we're saved by grace. We cannot save ourselves. We've inherited that sin nature through um, our relationship with Adam and Eve as our ancestors. And so we're born sinners. Now, the key thing is to remember we're sinners because of our sin nature, not the fact we do bad things. We do a bad thing because we're sinners. We're not made sinners because we do bad things. And so none of us can say, well, I'm, I'm a good person. I haven't murdered anyone. God will accept me. No, no, we're all on the same platform, aren't we? We all need a saviour, no matter whether you're Hitler or Mother Teresa. We've all sinned in some era. So we need to tell people that, that you, we're all lost. We're all in the same boat. None of us is better than the other. But the great news is that Jesus, the Creator, you know, the King of Kings, the Lord, God Himself came down, became one of us as a kinsman redeemer. He's got a blood relationship with us um, through, his, through His humanity. But he's also God, so only a perfect God can actually pay the price to pay for the sin of all of humanity right through history. So the good news is built on the top of bad news. Otherwise you give a wishy-washy gospel, you know, just accept Jesus and he'll give you a wonderful life and purpose and so on. Now that's true, he does give us purpose. But if we give people a false gospel where Jesus will give you a pain-free, stress-free, prosperous life, that's actually demeaning and it's going to lead to disappointment and people slipping away. Because... The Christian walk is hard, isn't it? There's going to be struggles, there's going to be persecutions, there's going to be pressure. And so it's not easy, but it's worth it. Okay, so it's interesting, when uh, Adam and Eve fell and God was pronouncing judgment upon the whole thing, including Satan and uh, Adam and Eve and, and the creation and so on, this is the first messianic prophecy, even back then, God was pointing to when Jesus as the Redeemer would come. And um, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 it says, I'll put enmity between thee and the woman. In other words, you know, even now people have a fear of serpents and so on, don't they? Between thy seed and her seed. Now I've actually taken a little liberty in uppercase C because it actually is referring to, you know, the descent, the fruit of the woman. Because in the Jewish culture, it's always a patriarchal lineage, isn't it? Father to son, father to son. Here, Eve has been given the prophecy that your seed will defeat the serpent, isn't it? So it's actually pointing to Jesus. Right now, that's actually the she she thought that you know she when um, Seth was born and so on that it was actually I've given sorry Cain I've given birth to the Lord but no he's actually pointing to Jesus um, and you, Pastor Ron's got some amazing diagrams there isn't it pointing right through the whole messianic line right through Israel with all of her failings and so on there's still that thread right through in due season the Messiah would come and bring salvation so it's a powerful ministry isn't it and also Adam and, and Adam and Jesus together are so both are vitally important to the gospel. It says in 1 Corinthians 15, 45 to 47, And so it is written, The first man, Adam, again, a real person, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit, that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. So first the natural, then the spiritual. The first man is of the earth, you know, Adam created out from the soil, He's earthy. The second man, Jesus, is a Lord from heaven. So both the first Adam and the last Adam need to be real people for the gospel to make sense. Okay, so that's the sort of theology. Again, honouring Jesus. He's the central figure of all of the, the gospel. And again, I talked last night about many of the young people, and that's why I'm so encouraged here to see lots and lots of young smiley faces. And at some churches I go to, and I'm almost the youngest person there. Yeah, they, love, they love the Lord, but it's a sea of white hair, isn't it? No, I've got no hair, actually. <laughs> it's a mutation. Actually, that song was more about the fuzzy wuzzy hair. And fuzzy. <laughs> anyway, um, as I always joke, grass doesn't grow on a busy street. <laughs> <laughs> That's one, 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 yeah. 
But anyway, the young people, though, many of them do struggle, don't they? They're brought up in a Christian home, they go to a church, they go to youth group. Once they go out into the world, they start to be encountering ideas at university or going flatting, going on the OE, things that start to hammer what they believe. And uh, sadly, many of them will go, well, I, I believe that Christian church stuff when I was a kid, but well, I had to go to church. And, but now I'm actually a free thinker. I'm, I've now been set free from those superstitions or that crutch, and I'm now free to be a free thinker and to move ahead in life. Um, that's sad, isn't it? Think of um, if they've been given a good grounding and they can trust God's word rationally, then they'll be held strong in their faith. And that's why, again, we have such an emphasis in creation ministries of reaching young people. And um, we've got some great resources out there, I'm going to show you some of them as well, about how we can equip young people to be strong in their faith, even in university. One of the key resources we have is our creation magazines. When I I've shared my testimony elsewhere. I was brought up in a Christian home. I didn't, um, I believed the Bible, but at high school at Wyoming College in Nelson, I was introduced to evolution in a big way. And our teacher said, well, some people believe that God created, but we know from science, and she put up all these things on the board, you know, the strata and the fossils, we can see from science that we actually evolved. You know, God didn't create us. And for me, I really respected her, but I was impacted with that idea. And I didn't lose my faith, but I was certainly shut down for a number of years because I didn't know how to defend the God created. Uh, eventually we had a creation speaker came to our church uh, when I was a young married man, way, way back, and um, Creation Magazine was presented. Because you know we, we give our messages, but you're not going to remember all the things we said. So it's almost like the, this is the appetizer, isn't it? The main course is to be able to equip yourself to get resources that you can read and, and review and help it to cement. And Creation Magazine is a really powerful way to do that. So it comes out four times a year, 56 pages, no paid adverts, a children's section, testimony of a PhD scientist, some uplifting articles about different things in nature, like these different creatures that have been adapted for desert situations. So a brilliant example of natural selection, which is not evolution. So it's a brilliant um, resource for your family and your friends. And so Mike's going to pass the clipboard around shortly. Now again, many of you are signed up, I know. But have a think about even a gift sub for someone if you want to equip and to share with people. So it comes out um, yeah, four times a year, and you get five digital subs as well. So you get this in the mail, and you also get an email with a link that you can share with up to five devices to get people to read it online. So it comes out to yeah, $35 one year, $98 for three years. If you'd like to sign up for a one year, we'll give you a back issue, and this is the, the current um, edition. And the three year one will give you two DVDs as well. One called Rapid Rocks, about how you get rapid uh, formation of rocks, and the second one is Fallout, which talks about why young people fall away from the faith and what we can do about it. So if you'd like to sign up, uh, Michael, pass the clipboards around. Just fill out the, the form there with your name and your postal address, details, email, etc. Choose whether you want the one or the three year, and then just tear off the little coupon on the side, take it to Mike afterwards, and he'll fix you up with your uh, free gifts. Okay, and here's an example of a young, young man that came through our email uh, a few years ago. He's a year 12 student in Australia, so I guess like 7, 4, or th year 13 here. He's in his final year. And he just said, I'm a year, year, year 12 student. I've been reading creation stuff for years, including Creation Magazine. It's a lot of fun. And I've actually found that I'm acing year 12 biology, specifically evolution. It's interesting. And we've got a really good resource about how you can go to university or high school, do biology, and ace the class, learn the evolution, get your exams right, but you don't have to lose your faith at all. He said, I actually know more about it than my teachers. Uh -huh. So yeah, it's great to equip our young people with evolutions out there, understand what the basis of it is and where the failings are. So we're just going to spend a little bit of time now just going through science, right? So you read through a little bit of science? Lots of theology. I just want to go through a few things, how we can look at the world around us and realise that with biblical glasses on, we can see that the Bible makes so much sense. So what about science? Question, isn't it? How can you um, disprove science? Well, are you anti-science or something? You're one of these Christian people. Are you anti-science? No, I'm an electronics engineer. I do hardware and software development, and so I know about technology. I love technology. Now, Mikey works with um, you know, jet engines and so on. That's cool technology. So we both love technology. We love science. We're not afraid of it. Um, it's actually the false things that are masquerading as science, philosophy. That's what we disagree with. So we have, very quickly, two basic types of science. The science that gave us all the blessings we have today, you know, our internet, our medicine, our air travel, all the amazing 
things we have come from what we call operational science, where you observe, you test, you repeat over and over again, the scientific method. That's how science advances, that's how things progress, and, and it builds one generation on the next, one finding on the next. And it's actually thinking God's thoughts after him. Many of the uh, great scientists were Bible-believing creationists. But the key thing is that all operational science is done in the present. You can repeat tests over and over again in the present. I suddenly found a fossil, I dug this fossil up. And I look at it, I actually have a different type of science to apply to this fossil. I look at it, but it doesn't uh, speak to me about anything, it doesn't give me a, a tag hanging on it saying how old it is, it's just a fossil. So I'm going to pass two fossils around. These are actually crab fossils from not far south of here, in South Canterbury. And you'll see that they're very dead. <laughs> but, you know, again, so you, at the moment you have a piece of evidence in your hand. But we can't observe that being formed. We can't test it. It's a one-off event in the past. We can't repeat it. So it's a different type of science we apply to this. It's actually almost like a crime scene, isn't it? We come across um, a set of clues. We have to come up with an, a story that may be credible, but it's, we can't know for sure what actually happened. So this type of science is much, much weaker than operational science. Okay? So we have to bring an interpretation to the evidence and the facts about how they could have come to be. So I take this and I come up with, if I believe the Bible, I can say, well, that's probably a result of something like the flood or a post-flood event where things were rapidly buried and became fossilized. Or, no, this gradually got buried and covered up over millions of years and turned to stone. So it's, it's just a fact. The interpretation is based on my worldview. Okay, so we bring assumptions to historical science. So when we find a fossil, the find is a fact. And we use operational science to weigh it, to x-ray it, to look at it and so on. We can do lots of great science on the fact in my hand. But the age and so on is an interpretation. It's impossible to directly measure the age of anything. So what about radiometric really dating? You can measure anything very accurately. No, it's impossible to measure the age of anything directly. And we've got some really good resources there about radiometric dating and why it falls apart in so many ways. It's not an infallible push the button and it pops out as you know, 4 billion years plus or minus 20 million years. That's the accuracy of the isotopes they measure. The age is an interpretation. Okay, so the key thing is remember that we all have the same facts. This is great evidence for creation. It's great evidence for evolution. It's just whatever you want to spin it as. It can be applied to both. So we have the same facts, we, the argument is over the interpretation. So it's not science versus faith, you know. We've got our science over here. If you want to believe your myths and gives you comfort, that's great. We've got facts, we've got science. No, we actually have science and science, and evolution is a faith-based assumption, and so is creation. Both of them can't be proved scientifically. We have to put, have faith in both. So I'm just going to finish off with some sections here. So when we put our Bible glasses on, we look at the world around us, things we can observe, things we can look at. Does it stack up better with the evolutionary millions of years, slow and gradual, uniformitarian idea, i.e. present is the key to the past? Or does it fit in much, much better with the history as outlined in the Bible? So, put your glasses on. We're going to put on our Bible glasses. It's actually, before we change glasses, we're just hammered, aren't we, with... Everything in our education system, in our National Geographics, our popular media, our social media, our classrooms, there's only one side that's pushed over and over again. Evolution, no God, millions of years. Evolution, no God, millions of years. We're not special. You think you're special, you're not. You know? And again, the worship we had this morning, again, that I'm special, aren't we? I'm, thank you, Jesus, for making me me. The world, we're just an animal, as I talked about last night. So it says that he's... The he that is first in his own cause seems just. So evolution seems credible. You see all these scientists talking about it, and they show you the graphs and the, the pictures and the amazing graphics. Oh, it's uh, hard to dispute that, isn't it? It seems right until you come along and you actually examine. And so, until his neighbour cometh and searches him. So we need to actually look at the other side, put on our Bible glasses, and we find it makes so much sense. So I just want to touch on, uh, particularly on fossils. You've got fossils in your hands there. Now we're told that um, you know, fossils take millions of years to form, slow and gradual. You know, fossils are proof of deep time. 
So we have, you know, all around the world we've got billions of dead things, you know, they're in sedimentary rock layers all around the world. Now the standard story, if you go to a university or go to a museum, is this sort of spiel, this is from um, Australian Dinosaur Museum. Something dies, dinosaur, fish, whale, whatever, dies out in the open, sinks down to the bottom of the, the ocean or the lake or whatever, and over time, you know, sediment comes in, each fresh of uh, rainfall sediment comes in, covers up the bones slowly, slowly over time, and then over huge amounts of time, the minerals replace the organic material. Eventually, you end up with a fossil, and you get uplift, you get erosion, and you dig it out, and oh, they have a fossil. Now, that seems pretty credible, isn't it? I could, I could go with that. My high school teacher taught me this, and it seemed very believable to me. But if I walk away now, how do I defend this? Okay, we put on our common sense glasses, we go out into the world, and we look around at things. <coughs> it's a little bit gross in some ways. Things that die out in the open. Okay, so let's just see if this is testable. This idea of slow and gradual, something dying, waiting to be buried. So imagine we have a massive fish kill here right here. Now can you imagine how bad that would smell? <laughs> but if we went back, say, um, a month, two months later, what would we actually find here, do you think, in this place, when you have millions of dead fish? Lots of really happy seagulls were stuck in there. But yeah, things would start to float, they'd be scavenged, they'd start to rot, and when they fell apart, bits would fall to the bottom, lots of other critters would come in and clean up the bits. And within a few weeks, months, or whatever, all that would be gone, there'd be no evidence at all. Even something as big as a whale, they've now shown that within 60 to 80 years, a whale has completely consumed bones, the works have all gone. Now I've actually done a bit of scuba diving, and I've never seen anything lying on the bottom of the lake or you, know, you watch nature programs, where's all the dead stuff? We just don't see things in the open, even roadkill, possums and that. They're scavenged, they rot away, they disappear within a very short time. So where are all these things waiting to be fossilised? It's not there, is it? And you think of something as big as like a dinosaur, especially you know, if they, it's a little bit gross, but if they die and they start to, to bloat and so on, the amount of sediment required to hold down a huge creature is massive. So you're talking metres, tens of metres of sediment, there's no event happening today that we ever see where you get that amount of sediment coming down. And yet the flood is a perfect environment where you have massive amounts of sediment coming and covering creatures very quickly. So this is how fossils have to form. Every fossil had to be very quickly to become a fossil. So here's little Freddie Fish swimming along, and he's enjoying his day, everything's going really, really well, until suddenly there's this big slump of um, sediment, you know, silt, mud and sand comes down and squashes poor Freddie. Yes, sadly, Fred, Freddie is dead. But you see, notice that Freddie, that he's been covered up with all this mineral-rich uh, sediment, but he's excluded from oxygen, he's protected from bacteria, from scavengers, and so he's in a position where the fossilisation process can begin. And they're finding now that fossils can actually form very quickly within just a few years. And so, yeah, whenever you find a fossil, it had to be very quickly. Otherwise, it would just rot away and be scavenged. And then we've got a few little examples, again, very well known, I'm sure you've seen these before, but this is one of our favourites, is a fish eating another fish. Look at the details, it hasn't rotted or fallen apart, the details of the, of the fins and the, the bones and everything, absolutely snap, snap frozen. And another very well known icon here is the female ichthyosaur giving birth, there she is, covered with all the silt and, and so on while she's giving birth to Junior. Now this, I've talked about this, this big um, slump of material happening. Well, it actually happened in New Zealand four years ago, you know, with the Kaikoura earthquake, that huge uplift, when all the seabed, seabed lifted off Kaikoura. Well, that caused what they call a turbidity current and a huge uh, underwater avalanche of mud and silt let go from the uh, continental shelf, and it rolled out underwater, and went out for hundreds of kilometres, just wiping out everything. And Niwa have done some amazing um, sediment studies on that, seeing how far it went. So exactly like Freddie, there's millions or billions of things out off this coast here that are now in that position, buried under silt and starting to turn into fossils. So you, know, you need a big event like that. And the flood, of course, was magnitudes bigger than that. But it's an example we see in the world around us. And of course, Mike, uh, he's got a great one here, that many dinosaur fossils, especially long neck ones, they have this classic, it's called the epistonic uh, posture, and it means that they're, they're basically being drowned in asphyxia, they go into that arch mode as they die, and so it shows they've been drowned or smothered under silt and mud. Okay, so I just wanted to touch on dinosaurs again briefly, so no one's going to be too scared by this one. I heard some one story about, um, was it Mike, you were telling me about somebody had a, a dinosaur picture or something, like a young child saw it, and they were, they were terrified for ages, you know, so 
hopefully no one's going to need counselling after this. But dinosaurs actually have a message. They're one of the most favourite things young people will love is dinosaurs and Jurassic Park and all these big scary T-Rex things. And yet a lot of young people can quote all the different species. And this one lied, lived 60 million years ago, and this one 80 million years ago, and this is a Stegosaur, and this is a Triceratops. And so dinosaurs are really a great way to engage with young people. And of course it's a great way to indoctrinate people too. And so here's, uh, we've got two little testimonies. Here's this guy, um, Tom Holland. He's actually a BBC commentator, a very talented writer, a brilliant writer. And he was brought up in a Christian home. But he says here that um, the dinosaurs, for him the turning point was dinosaurs. He said, I vividly remember my shock when I opened a children's Bible and I found an illustration on the first page of Adam and Eve with a brachiosaur. And we have pictures and so on. We very much say that uh, dinosaurs and people live together. But he saw this and went, whoa, I don't think so. He actually said, even though as a six-year-old, obviously very intelligent, he said, I may have been, uh, only six years old I may have been, but of one thing I was rock-solid certain. No human being had ever seen a sauropod. A faint shadow of doubt for the first time had been brought to darken my Christian faith, you see? So that was, for him that was a, I don't think so. You know, the Bible immediately dropped down and he started to doubt it. And of course he went out and he wrote that book, Why I Was Wrong About Christianity. See, dinosaurs started it and he slipped away and lost his faith. And here's another person here, a blogger writing for the Meaning Without God project, promoted by Richard Dawkins. And they said, dinosaurs were my gateway drug to atheism. While I was still six or seven years away from reaching the conclusion that God either didn't care about us or didn't exist, dinosaurs had already shared an important secret. The Bible can be wrong. You see, so... Again, somebody's gone down this track of atheism because dinosaurs seem to confound the account of the Bible. So the key thing is to remember that dinosaurs are a brilliant way to actually show that the Bible can be believed. And we've got some really good resources on dinosaurs. It's something not to be afraid of, but to celebrate and to share. And so the conclusions about the fossils and their message is based on the worldview, the interpretation you bring to the, the facts. Okay? So we all have the same fossils. What you believe about them is based on your worldview. And this is again very well known now, but um, people maybe outside Christian circles are shocked by this still. So here's Dr. Mary Schweitzer. She's a very clever paleontologist. And back in the 1990s, they found a big T-Rex skeleton that was too big to lift out by helicopter. So they had to break the femur, the thigh bone open. And when they did it, it's, um, it's not fossilized. It was still, still viable soft tissue. It was obviously a bit smelly, they talked about. So they took this back to the lab and they analyzed it under a microscope. And they found that there were actually still visible evidence of red blood cells within this tissue of this tiny dinosaur bone. Now, my wife, Desma, she's actually a veterinary hematologist. She works in a vet lab studying blood. And they know that blood deteriorates very quickly. So to say that blood even lasts thousands of years back from the flood and, and the post-flood events is amazing. But 65 million years, even if it was hermetically sealed, deep frozen, in a sort of lead-sealed, it just falls apart by the natural molecular movement. Blood cells cannot last 65 million years. And see, Dr. Schweitzer, she's actually a Christian, but she hangs on to the millions of years. Millions of years never get let go because if millions of years aren't true, evolution's not credible. So they will never let go of deep time because evolution must have deep time. And now they're finding soft tissue all the time. They're finding triceratops horns. They're finding all sorts of duck-billed uh, dinosaur bones and so on with visible, unfossilized tissues in them. And this is causing a major stir in the paleontological environment. Because how do you explain this? They're trying different ideas. Well, maybe iron helps to reinforce the hemoglobin and it lasts longer. Or maybe that helps to explain why it lasted since the flood, but not millions of years. It's just not possible. So again, engaging with our young people. This is a powerful book for uh, young, intelligent children who love dinosaurs. Give this to them. It's really God-honoring, scripturally based, exciting and interesting about how to look at dinosaurs with your Bible glasses on. It's a great book. We've also got this book called Deep Time, which is showing how the deep time idea came in. It's not scientific, it's a philosophy. That people looked at the rocks and they interpreted, they assumed that they'd taken millions of years, and they formed this basis that eventually uh, gave Charles Darwin the millions of years he needed for his theory, and the whole thing has um, started to accelerate. It's a great book, very uh, easy to read. Also the Answers book. Love to promote this because this has got answers to the 60 most asked questions that people ask. You know, who was Cain's wife? Um, was the flood global? What about human fossils? Um, how did animals get to Australia? 
Where do the different races come from, as I talked about last night? What about dinosaurs? What about carbon dating? What about distant stars in the young universe, etc.? So it's a really good uh, family-friendly book to give you those answers. And we've also got a, an intro pack, which is the answers book with another Refusing Evolution book and a DVD to get you um, a bit further along the way. And if you've got people who are involved in science and academia, they're actually maybe got a PhD or they're very uh, you know, well trained, they often struggle with this whole idea saying, well, this is all a bit you know, family level, it's not really scientific. This is a very, very powerful book to give them that actually was written by nine PhD scientists. And this actually goes directly back to the pillars of evolution and shows why they do not stack up scientifically. So it's quite an in-depth book. It talks about things like the fossil record, the origin of life, cosmology, um, geology, radiometric dating, and so on. It's a really good book for thinkers. And we've got lots of children's books to encourage young people with God's word. And Six Days magazine, uh, which is a collection of magazine articles, creation magazine articles aimed at young people. And of course, lots of free tracks over there. Please grab those tracks, including a coronavirus track, which has come out fairly recently. You know, the coronavirus catastrophe, am I going to die? Now, fortunately, here in New Zealand, we're very, that's not really a big concern. Uh, but some countries, that's a big deal, isn't it? Am I going to die of this? So, but it, it basically presents the gospel that even amongst this pain and suffering, we need to be uh, ready to receive Jesus. We may not die of coronavirus, but we're all going to die sometime. So the key thing is to equip us to reach out so as I had last night, I'm going to finish with this. Are you equipped? Am I equipped to engage with people, to share the love of Jesus in a rational, cogent way? So they actually have, they have strongholds pulled down. They're going to help them to come to a closer relationship with God, the God revealed in the Bible. So thank you. I'll pass back to...